I'm speechless. But don't worry, it's not going to last long. So not that lucky this morning. George, you've ruined me. I just about don't go anywhere else now but to the message. And I appreciate it. From the book of Luke, chapter 16, 17, I'm sorry. It happened that as he made his way toward Jerusalem, he crossed over the border between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered the village, ten men, all lepers, met him. They kept their distance, but they raised their voices, calling out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Taking a good look at them, he said, Go. Show yourselves to the priests. And they went, and while still on their way, they became clean. One of them, when he realized that he was healed, turned around and came back, shouting his gratitude, glorifying God. He knelt at Jesus' feet, so grateful. He couldn't thank him enough. And that man was a Samaritan. Jesus said, Were there not ten healed? Where are the nine? Can none be found to come back and give glory to God except for this outsider? And then he said to the man, Get up. On your way. Your faith has healed you and saved you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. If you have ever doubted the importance of saying thank you to someone when a thank you is due, I want you to really consider our scripture this morning and the story that is our text for the sermon. Now Luke tells us, and you know this, I really didn't even need to read the scripture, that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. And as he passed near Galilee and Samaria, he was met by ten lepers walking along the way. And they called out to him, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And what did Jesus do? He sent them on to the priests. And as they went there, the lepers were healed. Now, <clears throat> most people focus on the healing part of this episode. But Jesus said, your faith has made you well. And I know, I've heard and you've heard sermons preached, millions of them, on the relationship between faith and healing. The relationship between our body and our spirit, which makes for a totally healthy person. Rise, he said, and go your way. Your faith has made you well. But this morning in my message, I want us to focus on another part of the story. That part of the story that has to do with gratitude. And over the next four or five weeks, as we get closer and closer to Thanksgiving, you're going to hear about gratitude. So there were ten lepers. Ten lepers that were healed that day, one came back to say thank you. Ten percent. Ten percent. One out of ten. The other nine lepers, they were healed, they were made whole, but they still weren't healthy in that whole sense because none of them walked away from that meeting with Jesus with a thankful Heart. Now, so that we don't miss the drama involved here, I think even though it's a little bit not pretty, we can't help but recall what kind of disease we're talking about. Now, we don't know anything much at all about leprosy here in the United States or even in the Western world. It almost has disappeared. But it's still a major, major problem in India. You know stories about how Mother Teresa worked with folks that were lepers, gave her life to helping those that had no hope whatsoever. 
you still find leprosy in some parts of Africa and in a few parts of Asia, but leprosy by and large has disappeared from the world that we know. And out of sight is out of mind. So we tend to forget what a terrible and terrifying disease leprosy is today, but particularly was way back then. And you can carry the disease in your body for years before the symptoms appear. And the symptoms are minor. They first appear somewhere on your arm, your hand, your shin, wherever. It's little tiny nodules on your skin. But over time, they grow larger and larger. And they force deep crags and wrinkles on your body. And then your lips and your nose and your eye and your earlobes grow thicker until your face begins to look like some kind of an animal's face. And you get skin ulcers everywhere. And those cause your arms and your legs to be covered with open sores and become terribly mutilated. And then you start losing your fingers and your toes. And finally, most people with leprosy lose their sight. It's a grim, grim disease. And back then, if the disease weren't cruel enough, there were also the social aspects of it because those with leprosy were totally ostracized. Even in the Bible times, there were strict rules given for dealing with lepers. And their situation was even worse then than what just happened to some of us two years ago. Quarantine? You know, we know about it. When you were diagnosed a leper, you were cut off completely from the rest of the world. You had to wear mourning clothes. You had to shave your head. Your lips were veiled, and everywhere you went, you had to cry out, unclean, unclean, so that others would not be anywhere near you. Does that sound like a story we've heard over the last two and a half years? It does. We're familiar with it. You know, if you were a leper then, you lived outside of the village. You lived in a cave where they dug huge pits for folks with leprosy to live in. You spent your days begging. You spent your nights praying, praying to die. Now, when I think about the horrors of that disease, it's very hard for me to understand why all 10 of those lepers didn't come running back to Jesus to thank him. I would have thought they would have spent hours, if not days and weeks, looking for him until they found that man who had freed them from this dreadful disease and thanked him to his face. You know what? I like to be thanked for things that I do, and so do you. And if you read the scripture, scripture, we know that even Jesus himself wanted to be thanked. What did he say to the one leper who did not return? He said, there were ten men who were healed. Where are the other nine? Why is this foreigner the only one who came back to give thanks to God? Well, probably our problems aren't as severe as that and those lepers were. But God's word in this passage of scripture needs to make us think about the way we are not nearly as thankful as we should be. Now, sadly, I think that probably most of us are like those nine lepers in the story. Or maybe they're like when we come to a four-way stop sign and we allow people to go first. How many folks at least acknowledge and say thank you because we let them go first? Or how many times do I say thank you when somebody lets me go first? You know that four-way stop sign, that's one of the most enigmatic things that I can think of because nobody knows who goes first. It comes down to Ha! I'm out of here. Or it comes down to, John, go ahead. You go first. And somewhere 
there is a conscience, conscious call to either go or not go. What I'm saying is, friends, we don't say thank you enough for the kindnesses that we receive, whether they're huge or whether they're tiny. We get them every day. And so frequently, we just walk away and we take them for granted. Now, as I looked at this and thought about it, it dawned on me. Because of my life's experiences, and you can because of your life's experiences, we can be thankful even during the most difficult times of our lives. I truly believe that. And we see an especially inspiring example of a brave and thankful heart in the story behind one of our favorite, most popular hymns in all of Christendom. And that hymn we will sing as we get closer to Thanksgiving. And the title of the hymn is, Now Thank We, All Our God. As a matter of fact, it might pop up in a little while. This particular hymn, though, was written in the 1600s, long ago, during the Thirty Years' War over in Germany. And the author of that hymn was a Lutheran minister. His name was Martin Rinkert. And it was written in the town of Eilenburg, E-I-L-E-N-B-E-R-G, which is in northern Germany. Now, 1600s, we're just that far removed from the medieval times. And Eilenburg was a walled city. So in the midst of this 30 years war, it became a sanctuary. It became a haven for refugees who were seeking safety and refuge from all of the fighting, but it soon became crowded and food came, became short and hard to come by. And on top of that, then a famine hit and food became even more scarce and that's not as far as it went. There were more problems. A plague came to northern Germany and instead of being a haven, or a sanctuary, Eilenberg became a great bustling morgue. In one year alone, that pastor, Pastor Reichardt, conducted over, hang on to this, 4,500 funerals in one year. One of those funerals was his wife. And the war dragged on. And the suffering kept on going. And yet, through it all, this man never lost his courage. He never lost his faith. Even during the darkest days of Eilenberg's history, he was able to write the hymn that we're going to sing in just a minute. Now thank we all our God with hearts and hands and voices who wondrous things have done in whom the world rejoices. So keep us in his grace and guide us when perplexed and free us from all our ills in this world and the next. Folks, even when he was waist deep in death and destruction, this minister, Rinkart, was able to lift his sights from the, direct, the abyss of agony and suffering that he was in and he looked to a higher plane he kept his mind on God's love when the world was filled with nothing but hate. He kept his mind on God's promises of heaven when the world that he was living in was a living hell. This morning, as we think about sometimes how we get, can we not be the same type of people whose lives actually, when you look at other folks around us, our lives are pretty much trouble-free. We've got problems, but compared to the man who wrote this hymn, we got no problems at all. So, the question I ask you now is who do you say thankful to? And as all of us look back on our lives, think about it. Who are the people that helped you get to where you are on October the 9th, 2022. 
Who are those that are near and dear to you? Who are helping you even today? The people in your own home or in your family. The very people that so 